good day and welcome to God Day. I'm Sarah Tan. Romans 8. Today, I'm just going to go through Romans 8 with you and try to do it in our half hour time. I read this at my husband's funeral and it's a sermon in itself. Let's have a look. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? No condemnation. The enemy loves to condemn us. He loves to sit on our shoulder and say, you did bad, you were wrong, you're bad, you did the wrong thing, you made a mistake. We are told not to judge ourselves because God says don't judge. And in that, it includes ourselves. There is no condemnation for those who have, uh, of us are in Christ Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe and trust in him, if you've surrendered your life to him, that little voice that condemns is not God. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. We have a task to surrender our bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. It's a journey though. Even Paul said, although Jesus said, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, even Paul, who aspired to it, could not achieve it. He said that himself. We attempt, we try, we aim, to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. There is one law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. These encapsulate the Ten Commandments. This encapsulates the whole of the law of the Jews, because Jesus was speaking to the Jews, and by inheritance, the Gentiles who walk in Christ Jesus. The law is fulfilled in Jesus, not erased, fulfilled, and the law of love helps us to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. The law could not do, it was weak. It was perfect law, it was God's law, but in the flesh we are weak, we succumbed. Historically, the Jews succumbed and failed to worship God. So they lost land, then they'd praise and pray and ask God's forgiveness and he'd forgive and then he'd allow them to victory again and it went in cycles. Likewise, all of us are born knowing God, but we lose sight. Look at the rebellious two-year-old. That's just an example, because in, in, internally, sometimes we're two years old, aren't we? So we are weak in the flesh, but in the Son, we are strong by the Spirit. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit the righteous requirement of God, that the law might be fulfilled, is fulfilled in the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. In my personal journey, more and more, I am interested, drawn to, seeking, God's anointing and God's spirit and to live by the spirit. 
there was an occasion where five days I was under the anointing. Five days, 24-7. It was wonderful. And I was much nicer person. I don't know why the anointing came like that, and I don't know why it left. But I know it gave me a taste for what's possible. And as I said, Jesus said, be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. And he didn't set us up to fail. So by the Spirit, we can. And by surrendering our flesh, each day we get a little better at living under the anointing, living by the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. And when we know that, we begin to recognize we want less and less of this world. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. God talks about his rest and he gives us rest. That is life and peace, his rest, abiding, as John writes in, in and Jesus says in John 15, I'm the vine, he who abides in me. All of these things are living spiritually minded. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Carnal is flesh. It's not, sometimes we think of carnal as sin or as sexual sin, but carnal is anything of the flesh. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we can do all kinds of works, wonderful works, but if it's not what God's asked us to do, then it's nothing. He says, I prefer obedience over sacrifice. He just wants us to do as he leads. And sometimes that's just waiting on him, resting in him, being with him, and that's all. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. That's such victorious statement. That is so wonderful. The spirit of God dwells in anyone who's asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior and is following surrendered to them. That's it, the Spirit of God. So, the Spirit, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Wow. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So we keep the gluttony, we keep eating, feeding, we keep our eyes looking on stupid, violent, horrible things, we're just feeding the flesh, which is dead anyway, which is really silly. It's not very practical, is it? But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. What a victory. That is astounding. That is amazing. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, that spirit who hovered over the earth at creation, that spirit who gave the tongues of fire to the disciples in the upper room at Pentecost, that spirit resides in each of us. Don't tell me that the, the anointing of God or the spirit of God or the, the, the miracles of God are dead. No. Because if that's the case, then Romans chapter 8 is dead. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That is not just for when we die and go to heaven. That is for now. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And the flesh does die. We do have mortal bodies. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So if every day, every moment, we are surrendered to God and walk in that and resist our urges and allow our obedience to God 
not as a slave, not as put down, but free to do as he leads and guides us by the spirit, which is so much more alive and life-giving than by the flesh, then we will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And this is true biology. We are all sons of God who are in Christ Jesus. Spiritual biology. There is no male or female in the Spirit. We are all sons of God. We don't need to add and daughters. He means that. Sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. Ah, he's talking to the Gentiles. By whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We have been grafted into the vine. We are a part of the inheritance of Abraham. We as Gentiles join with the Jews who believe in Jesus, the Messianic Jews, we are all grafted in and he can graft in more Gentiles. He can graft in the Jews who've not yet received Yeshua. We are all able to cry out, Abba, Daddy, help me. <laughs> the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So there's the Holy Spirit and we have our own spirit which is dormant at birth because of Adam's sin. But when we receive Jesus, it becomes alive. And that is what gives us born again status. We are children of God and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So we inherit the same everlasting life that Jesus inherits or has. Jesus died and rose again. Our flesh may not rise again in the same way until he comes again, but we have new bodies. We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. So, Jesus has many mansions for us in heaven when we ascend to him. And we, like him, will be with God. If, indeed, we suffer with him, that we all may be glorified, also may be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, Paul suffered a lot and he wrote um, a lot of his letters in prison and he knew his death was imminent. Well, when he was in prison with the Romans, I think that was a fairly early letter, so he didn't know that he wouldn't be released or he didn't know when he was gonna die. But certainly with later letters, I think, Timothy was one of the, the Timothy letters were, were later and he knew his life was coming to an end. He says so. But he suffered in the meantime. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to com be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's not just the, 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 the glory after life on this earth, but revealed in us and through us. God's glory will be revealed in us. Well, it doesn't make me say, oh, bring on the suffering, but it does put it into perspective. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. All of creation is waiting for us to develop and be as he wants us to be. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. But the, because the creation itself also will be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
the whole earth is moaning. All of Psalms is full of praising God for the creation of the earth. On and on in different parts of the word in the Old Testament, in Exodus, you created the earth, you, you made the sea part and gave us deliverance. On and on, creation is mentioned. We must know that the creation suffers with us. We can see how the creation has suffered by the hand of man, but it's the creation that suffers in spite of man as well. It doesn't matter whether man is doing something to the earth or not. Creation still suffers. The creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For example, animals do not eat each other once upon a time. Even that creation was corrupted when Adam sinned. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Do we not eagerly await for Jesus' return? Do we not see the world suffering or we find life hard sometimes and say, oh, I wish you'd just take me, Lord. Take me to your glory because the things that are happening in this earth are hard, but it's not time. And so we carry on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But we know that the creation is groaning just as we are and we are to persevere. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. And this is where our character comes in. Our character grows. The Spirit teaches us, convicts us, molds us as we allow ourselves to surrender to God. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Speaking in tongues is helpful. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The mind of Christ, the mind of the Spirit, the mind of the Father are all one. And he searches our hearts that have the Spirit of God within us, seeking the will of God. And the Spirit and Jesus there is intercession going on in heaven for us. I happen to believe that sometimes those who pass away and are in the cloud of witnesses, I don't know if I believe it or I wonder, I've not perhaps decided, but pretty much I think that Alan and others are praying on our behalf, not for our salvation, but for help, for breakthrough the cloud of witnesses praying with Jesus in heaven who makes intercession for us. That's powerful. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Our life is a journey of finding out what his purpose is for us. And I'll talk about knowing our purpose another time. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So we are not Jesus, we are not the Savior, but we are sons like him. And the Lord God has been waiting. He waited for 4,000 years before he sent Jesus, and his disciples, we, are his workmanship. And he has been waiting for us and is waiting for us to be perfected. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. There are those in heaven who have preceded us. 
those cloud of witnesses. Are they in his glory? What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? No one. It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Satan. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus intercedes, the spirit convicts, only Satan condemns, and the glory of the Lord shines through us as we surrender. Who shall, sep who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Who shall separate us? Nothing. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. This you can look at as we are persecuted or we are surrendered. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, that includes Satan, he was created, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is Romans 8. This is packed full of the truth of the love of God, the commitment that he has to us, the patience he has for us to be perfected, the intercession that Jesus does for us, the spirit of God who lives in us to correct us and guide us and teach us and empower us and live through us so that we can minister, so that we can glorify God, so that we can rest and be at peace. This one chapter has so much in it. How can anybody deny what food and sustenance is in the word of God? There is nothing, no death nor life, nor angels, including fallen angels, nor principalities or powers, those things which war against the goodness of God, nor things in the present, nor things to come. Nothing too high or too deep. No created thing can separate us from the love of God. And the love of God is found in and through Jesus, the Savior, Christ, our Lord. The Father is the Lord of all. He gave us the Son, who is our Lord, when we surrender to him. The Spirit came. Jesus left. He said, I have to leave. He was fully human, fully formed, resurrected from the dead, had the nails in his hands or wrists, or depending on your you know, understanding of history, and in his feet, and the sword, the scars in his side. Jesus was human and didn't stay on the earth to live beyond his 33 years because he had to go and ascend to heaven in order that the helper, the comforter, the Spirit of God could come. And the Spirit of God resides within us. Boy, did he come. He came at Pentecost 
tongues of fire from the heads of every believer in that upper room. He came, that spirit, and he resides in us, and he activates our spirit when we surrender. Jesus has the authority that no other person has authority because he was sinless, because sin comes from the Father and his Father was God, unlike any other human being whose Father is a person, a human being, a man. Jesus has authority to heal and deliver. The Spirit has the power in us that we can heal and deliver by Jesus' name and his grace. The Father loves us, he cares for us, he gives us his word for food, Jesus. He gives us spirit to quench our thirst, the water of God. Our body and our spirit are on this earth for him. Let us not doubt the power of this Bible. Bless you all, Romans 8 in half an hour. Holy God, you are amazing. Bless you. Bye for now. Thank you.